Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Does it sound like it's on? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2014 Blandy Lectures. It's wonderful to see you all here. The Blandy Lectures were uh, established after the death of Gray Blandy, who was the first dean of the Seminary of the Southwest. Uh, and it's convened ever since. It's a two-day event uh, built around a well-known speaker. The speaker is decided and the events are planned by the Alumni Steering Committee in consultation with the seminary faculty and leadership. And it gives alums a chance to uh, reconvene here and to um, have a edifying and, and interesting time together. So we're very, very happy um, to have this event this year. We also, in connection with the Blandy Lectures, give our two awards, the Hal Perry Award and the Durston McDonald Teaching Award. And tonight we give the Hal Perry Award, which you'll hear more about, and tomorrow before the lecture we'll give the Durston McDonald Teaching Award. I want to, um, ah, this is what I want to say, that if you have thoughts or ideas, you should tweet them at hashtag Blandy 2014. Okay? Now I know how to say that, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so now I'd like to introduce Reed Morgan, the chair of the Alumni Steering Committee. Nominees for the Halbrook Perry Award are considered by the Alumni Steering Committee who identify alumni exemplifying exceptional ministry to parishes, dioceses, and or specific communities or ministries in the Episcopal Church, locally, regionally, or worldwide. In the spirit of the Reverend Hal Brook Perry, emphasis is given to quiet, competent, and diligent service and leadership through education, formation, and the building up of the church and its people that might otherwise go unnoticed by the larger church in the world. Episcopal priest, family physician, hospice doctor, husband, and father, you have given quiet, skillful, and diligent service on behalf of the church's mission and on behalf of your patients. You earned your bachelor's degree from the University of the South and your doctor of medicine degree from the University of Arkansas. Your 20-year medical practice began in Arkansas in 1992 and continued throughout your studies at Seminary of the Southwest, where you earned the Master of Divinity degree in 2004. 
You are board certified in family medicine and in hospital and palliative care. You have served as rector of St. Thomas in Springdale, Arkansas, and as canon missioner for the Diocese of Arkansas. You served as interim CEO of the Circle of Life Hospice while you were priest associate at St. Paul's in Fayetteville, Arkansas. In 2012, St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in Seattle, Washington called you to be their seventh dean. Your friend and classmate, Tori Lightcap, noted that you often challenged professors and other students with the urgent question of relevance. What does this have to do with baptismal ministry? In your sermon titled, Continuing the Covenant, preached at St. Mark's Cathedral last year, you recounted your earlier predisposition to make every conversation about the baptismal covenant. You see covenant as a gift in which two parties become one, and the synergy of that connection can change the world. Your conviction that changing the world is possible because of God's continued covenant with us is evident in your ministry as doctor and priest. You are one who focuses your time on your priorities and gives yourself wholly to them, including seeking and serving Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself, and striving for justice and peace among all people. Following the Keat Cathedral Vestry's decision to allow Tent City for the Homeless back on cathedral grounds, you challenged the cathedral congregation with a question of covenant. What else might we be called to consider in the pursuit of God's justice? Not because it is right, but because love would have us do no other. Your seminary and alumni association are honored to present you with the 2014 Howe Brook Perry Distinguished Alumni Award, and it goes to the very Reverend Stephen Thomason, who is Dean of the Cathedral in Seattle. And Steve could not be here with us tonight, but we have uh, a video of his acceptance. Greetings from the Pacific Northwest and the Diocese of Olympia and St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle, Washington. I'm deeply honored and humbled by this uh, award as uh, the recipient of this year's Halbrook Perry Award for alumnus of our beloved Seminary of the Southwest. So honored and give thanks for the place that that uh, wonderful seminary and institution continues to play in my formation and in the life of the church. Not only in the time that I spent there in the years 2001 through 2004, but in the years since and in all the ways that my peers and the faculty that were there when I attended and those that have come since continue to shape my ministry and of all of us in the church. I'm deeply uh, grateful for that. I'm sorry that uh, I couldn't be with you today and on this occasion of the Blandy Lectures. Kathy and I had already planned to be out of the country and are, as you see this, uh, but this day we stop and give thanks and hold you all in our prayers and give thanks especially for the Seminary of the Southwest and all that it means to us and to the church. And I celebrate your ministries with you as well. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite Kevin Schubert to come down. Kevin is sort of the lead person on our Blandy Lecture Committee, and he is going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Reed. Distinguished Dean, and where are you? There you are. <laughs> <laughs> alumni and friends, I welcome um, one of the most genuine and gracious persons that I know that we have in the Episcopal Church here with us tonight. Similar to the Southwest and the Southwest Alumni Association welcomes Sarah Miles as the 2014 Blandy Lecturer. Sarah is the founder and director of the Food Pantry 
and serves as Director of Ministry at St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. Her books include Jesus Freak, Feeding, Healing, Raising the Dead, and Take This Bread, A Radical Conversion. She speaks, preaches, and leads workshops around the country, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, and on National Public Radio. Please join with me in welcoming Sarah as our Blandy Lecturer 2014 speaker. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Thanks to Dean Kittredge and the faculty and alums and students and to Kevin for that sweet introduction and for convincing me to come here and talk about physical and spiritual lives. You know, as somebody who never went to seminary, I'm a little anxious about being edifying, so you don't have to believe that, that part of it. <laughs> I also have to thank uh, Paul Fromberg, distinguished alum, and my guide to all things Texan, because uh, if eating half a pound of barbecued spare ribs and brisket with my hands from a piece of wax paper is not about the incarnation, I don't know what is. <laughs> so I want to talk about that physical and spiritual lives and their implications for worship. My most recent book is called City of God. I know it's not like the most original title. <laughs> and it takes place on one particular street corner in my own particular neighborhood, the mostly Latino Mission District of San Francisco, on one particular day, Ash Wednesday. And in the process of writing about taking ashes to people outside church buildings, it made me realize that I was documenting more than just one particular liturgical event. Those experiences on Ash Wednesday made me kind of generally obsessed with the ways that we understand liturgy and blessing and holiness and service and worship and devotion and, well, the incarnation, the embodied gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as the good news lives and breathes and suffers and dies and rises on that one particular Mission District street and on this particular corner of Austin and everywhere on God's earth in the body of every wino and working mom and cop and little kid who passes by just breathing. The incarnation is at the center of our faith, but it's scary to experience it as we say, in su propria carne, in your own meat. Because it feels risky to mix up the embarrassing facts of our mortal bodies, blood, sex, breath, disease, dirt, death, with faith, which we'd prefer to imagine as purely spiritual, elevated, and clean. Bodies aren't stable, they're alive. They're unpredictable, they're impure. It can feel safer sometimes to worship in a temple of stone where the fire will seem smaller and the overshadowing cloud less dark and the holy ground more neatly fenced in so that God will stay safely indoors and not be all up in my face. <laughs> um, you know, not in my meat, not in yours. But a spiritual life is a physical life. A spiritual life is a physical life. And blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who thirst, who sing, who are born to teenage girls in muddy stables and die naked and pierced, who eat fish with their hands and yell at their friends, who spit and kiss and groan in labor, who bleed and stumble and drink cool water, who breathe on one another and are made out of these crudest physical facts into 
one mystical body. I came really late to Christianity. I was knocked upside down by a midlife conversion, which was centered very physically around a literal chunk of bread handed to me by a stranger one morning at St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. Jesus invites everyone to his table, this stranger said, and so we offer the bread and wine which are Christ's body and blood to everybody without exception. I took the bread, more or less to be polite, and I understood two things at the same time. I was tasting real bread. It was made out of regular old flour and water and salt and yeast. I was drinking real, sort of nasty wine. <laughs> and I understood that God, who I did not believe in, was alive and was in my mouth. That was my first communion, and it totally short-circuited me. I wasn't a believer, and I certainly wasn't a seeker. I didn't know anything about Christianity, and I didn't know any Christians, except I knew I didn't like them. <laughs> I never decided what to believe as an intellectual proposition. I was found by this force that blows uncontrollably through the world, through the incarnate hands and mouth and flesh and blood, and that connects me to everybody else through that piece of bread. It was as Jesus' disciples say to him, it was intolerable. I couldn't swallow it. But I kept coming back because I was hungry. I wanted more. And because in this place that invited strangers into full participation in the liturgy, there was just no way to do this without doing it, without throwing my whole self and my whole body into the work. At St. Gregory's, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, the priest and whoever is helping serve communion that day gathers around the table in the middle of the room where the crowd is standing to break the fresh bread and pour wine before carrying it out to feed the crowd and to invite them to feed each other. Paul Fromberg, who's now our rector, likes to explain to the people who do this work that the surest sign of Jesus' actual presence in the Eucharist is when there's somebody completely inappropriate at the altar. <laughs> that would be me. One day as a relative newcomer, I was the person asked to help break loaves of communion bread and to make the same invitation. Jesus welcomes everyone to his table. And so we offer the bread and wine, which are Christ's body and blood to everyone without exception. A little shakily, I took the bread in my hand and handed the body of Christ to you, to the body of Christ, and it just cracked my world open again. And that bodily experience in the liturgy led me to another, to baptism. Scared, thrilled, filled, held by others, I promised to keep sharing in the breaking of bread. And I stood there trembling while this water poured over my head. And so, because I was new enough to the tradition to believe that those words meant something, I started a food pantry at the church, setting up a sort of free farmer's market with tables full of potatoes and lettuce and bread around the altar, right in the middle of the sanctuary, because I had promised to do so. It wasn't that I was interested in good deeds or in running a social service program. I just wanted more bread, more living water, more Jesus, more life. And the food pantry was modeled very explicitly on the worship. So our pantry just went ahead and gave away free groceries to anybody who showed up. Thieves, cripples, whores, foreigners, people possessed by demons, little kids, widows, and we asked unqualified people, like those first disciples, to help out, to participate fully. And from all over the city, poor people started to come to St. Gregory's every Friday, 100, 200, 450, 800. And just like me, some of them stayed. They changed. 
They began to feed each other around the altar and then take responsibility for running things and then start more pantry in other places. And I watched the body of Christ take form in the actual bodies of the most inappropriate people, all of whom, like me, had just come because they were hungry and wound up feeding others. And all of this happened without any respect for the boundaries we so like to set up between service and worship, between body and soul. The people at the pantry eat real food, which is, of course, holy. The people at the altar eat holy food, which is, of course, real. We're eating, we're drinking, we're washing, we're kissing, and no matter how much we try to make these actions into symbols, sacramental actions will never be make-believe. Jesus actually means it when he says the intolerable thing, my flesh is real food. And sharing groceries with friends and strangers around that table, like sharing communion bread with friends and strangers around the altar, allowed me to believe, and more importantly, to begin to act as if the stuff that we do on Sundays means something, and as a guide to our entire lives in church and outside. Because worship and service are both liturgy, and every church expresses that connection. All of our liturgy, for better or for worse, is saying something profound about what we believe to ourselves and to others. And just a note here, we'll talk more tomorrow about this, I emphatically am not talking about liturgical style for its own sake, or I'm not talking about aesthetics, whether you worship with booming organ music or cheesy folk songs or stained glass windows and in the round with applique vestments. There are all kinds of aesthetic and stylistic and cultural choices that people can make. But if we don't want our liturgies simply to be based in personal preference, taste, or class, and we do want to become a community, a body, with a shared life in Christ, then we have to be constantly praying and in conversation together about what it is we think our communities are really doing together in our liturgies, inside and outside of church buildings, and why we're doing it, and how that theology is going to inform what we do with the rest of our lives. And so the principles, not the styles, but the theological principles underlying any liturgy shape everything we do. For example, if we believe that Jesus welcomes everyone to his table, then a needy, undeserving stranger like me can be fed without having to prove anything. And that's why I started the food pantry modeled on that experience of Eucharist. We give groceries away without demanding ID or papers or proof of income. And because we see that God is inviting all people to participate in God's redeeming work, we invite everyone, everyone, to participate fully. So on Sundays, little kids and unbaptized doubters and saintly old church ladies all sing and pray and pass the chalice. There's not one set of people who are the performers of liturgy and another who sit back and watch. And so at the pantry, I walk up to people standing online and ask them to help out with organizing tables or giving away groceries. There isn't one set of people who are clients and one set who are professional volunteers. We all make the pantry together by hand. But you can do it differently. For example, on Sundays, if on Sundays only ordained people can touch the communion wafers or only baptized people can receive them, if church programs are staffed by old timers who cling to their control and don't let newcomers in, if there are a lot of rules about who deserves communion or who is allowed to participate in the service, if church is basically something carried out by resentful, burned out clergy experts for parishioners, 
no surprise. That's how your service work will look too. You'll make people fill out forms to register. You'll set up rules about who's allowed to volunteer, who's allowed to receive food. You'll complain about overwork and compassion fatigue because you're basically doing the work for other people, not with them. And in that, you will be modeling your worship and your service on the values of what St. Paul calls bitterly the world. It is a business model. It is a model of exchange. And it is an idolatrous attempt to disembody the living body of Christ. Because as I understand it, the blessing of the incarnation is that the temple has been pulled down, destroyed. And holy list now lives, albeit very inconveniently, in our human flesh. And this good news remains folly and a scandal to almost all of us who count us ourselves believers, and especially those of us who are church professionals. Why else would we still spend so much time obsessing about the temple of stone, how to build it up and decorate it and correctly conduct its rituals? Why else would we be embarrassed by the loud, queer, tone-deaf, or infant humans who mess up the perfection of our preserved in amber services? Why would we abstract the bread that we use in our worship until it looks as little as possible like something a human being could ever eat? <laughs> And why, in our liturgies of outreach and service, would we shrink from actual relationship, from touch, from lamentation, from tears and embrace, and instead talk about the other human beings we serve as clients instead of bodies and souls? We try so hard to keep the body, the image and the reality of the body, out of our worship and service. The brilliant uh, historian of religion, Robert Orsi, points out that many late 20th century Roman Catholic reformers in the United States took great pains to clean out all the figurative statues and icons of the past from church buildings and replace them with banners of sans serif type. So instead of this beautiful, bloody, tacky statue in a corner chapel, often female or dark-skinned or overdressed for the occasion, a real material figure with a face that you could kiss and touch and lay flowers and drop your tears upon, now there are all these bright, clean banners with abstract nouns floating up by the ceiling. Peace. Joy. And this was not, of course, only a Catholic trend. White Protestants just made it more of a privatized and secular trend, replacing mystery and blood and sweat and passion in the liturgy with disembodied sermons that sounded either sort of cheery and liberal, God is the NPR dad, <laughs> or cheery and conservative, God as the friendly, albeit gun-toting, suburban dad. <laughs> And in both cases, the living, suffering Jesus became too much. And the idea of actually eating him, intolerable. And this isn't just a problem of what Christians do on Sundays. Because the activism and service work of many churches in flight from the incarnation has often become part of what we like to call the nonprofit industrial complex. Justice becomes a program. Food becomes a ministry. Mercy becomes an issue. And instead of actual scarce cash pulled out of my own actual pocket and plunked into the actual hand of a hurting, usually undeserving poor person, there are business-like spreadsheets about deliverables. Instead of blind men and dirty, whiny women begging to be touched, there are clients who we studiously spend hours learning how not to touch. Instead of calling random housewives and fishermen to run headlong after Jesus no matter the cost, 
We offer prepackaged mission trips with signed consent forms and insurance policies. But the scandal of the incarnation abides with us. And so, inside and outside of church buildings, people still make liturgies out of flesh and blood. We saturate the world with worship, an eager imitation of God's saturating holiness, calling on these remembered prayers and misremembered rituals, on ancestors, on accidentally encountered strangers whose own conflicted conversations with God somehow leak into our bodies. Our liturgies happen in the real world, family tables and street corners, food pantries, even seminaries. Because, as an old Episcopal manual for priests says, we bear witness to the sovereignty of God, that he rules over the whole of life from birth to death, and that no concern of his children can be unimportant in his sight. There is no area of life from which God is shut out. Four years ago, after the first time I celebrated Ash Wednesday on Mission and 24th Street with Bertie Pearson here, I drove back up the hill to my church in the twilight. And as I slipped in and took a seat among the 20 or so parishioners who were gathered inside to pray with the candles flickering in what had been one of my favorite services of the whole year, all I could think was, this place is so small. Church is small. Church is so much more cowardly and less imaginative than it has to be. It's mindlessly stubborn about its own correctness. It's proud of its own power. It's petty, it's judgmental, it's unkind to those who disagree. But these failures of the institution, I begin to see, are precisely my own. And my own personal sins my nostalgia, my desire to stay indoors, to refuse new experience, to ignore demanding neighbors, to hide in the habitual. I bring these sins, as do you, into our churches and liturgies. But our sins are not the last word. And the good news is that the temple will always be too small to hold God. And so the rowdy, heterodox church of God's whole bickering body is set loose in the creation that God made to praise him, set loose in the incarnate meat of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, set loose in our human bodies. God has left the building. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk tomorrow afternoon a little bit more about some of the specifics of worship and liturgy to talk about um, the ways that we make those choices, um, show a few videos of it, talk about the food pantry and practice, and talk about the work more concretely. And we'll have that conversation tomorrow. But I wanted to just say quickly, if, um, if there are questions uh, that people have now, we can have a little time for Q&A uh, before dessert. But you have to stand up and bellow so that people can hear you. You said you were not a seeker and you didn't, not a believer. Why were you there that first time? Well, you know how, like, in retrospect, you always make the story sound good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, yes, I could say in retrospect, I think that was the breath of the Holy Spirit. 
that led me in there. Um, the more immediate answer is that I was a journalist, which means like, by profession I was nosy, right? <laughs> and the door was open. Um, and as we've discovered, as many of you may discover in your own buildings, the crazy thing is when you have the doors to your church open, people come in. And it's frightening to do, and I, I write about this a bunch in the Ash Wednesday book, and you know, as you know, uh, there's been a big movement in the Episcopal Church to take ashes outside on Ash Wednesday, which of course makes me just want to do everything outside too. Um, but the astonishing thing is, it's not, I mean, people literally followed us down the street saying, can I have those? Right? People, like this guy stopped his car and said, wait, my mom's in the back seat, can I have some? Can I get her some, right? I mean, it was, it was the desire for that connection was so strong. Um, and I think that that's true when you go out and bless people. I don't know how many of you do blessings of animals or blessings of bicycles or blessings of bicycles, animals, and motorcycles all together as we're gonna be doing in two weeks. Um, but the amount of praise, blessing, thanks, tears, and prayer that people are hungry for, um, it's not really boundaried by a couple of hours on Sunday morning. No, like, no, no, um, yeah, I mean, no, people didn't say you can't do that. I mean, I think I was lucky to be, um, my first communion was at St. Gregory's, and it was not that the church was incredibly excited about the idea of a food pantry, but they had this altar in the center of the room, and they said those words every Sunday. Right, and on the uh, on one side of the altar, there's a, a quote written in beautiful gilt letters from the Gospel of Luke that says, "This guy eats with sinners." Right, and on the other side, there's a quote from Isaac of Nineveh which says, "Did not our Lord share the table with publicans and harlots? Therefore, make no distinction between worthy and unworthy. All must be equal in your eyes to love and to serve." So, again, it was it's. A, was it difficult? Did it make people nervous? Yes, but was it clear that what we were doing was the same thing, right? Um, in terms of the amount of fear that people have about regulations and the nonprofit industrial complex and shouldn't you make people fill out a million forms, um, that's almost entirely in every place I've ever been invented fear. There's not actually a big authority telling you you can't do this. You buy a lot of food and you give it away to the wrong people. That's all it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paul. The, uh, Lydons, uh, <laughs> Very great. So we, um, there's a school down the street, an elementary school that works with us, and um, Paul and I host uh, like four or five of the kids from the fourth grade class come to help out at the food pantry. And uh, do you like know any fourth graders? Do you know how like obsessed they are with justice? and fairness and what's right, right? So they were like, they had a million questions. They were just like, well, I saw somebody with a cell phone and a car, like, how did she get food? Like, that Chinese lady was being really pushy. 
and doing that? And how come all those people are yelling and trying to get first in line? And how come you give it to people and, you know, like they might not even need it and somebody else would need it and it's not fair? Um, you may know that there's a little scriptural precedent for God's people saying it isn't fair. Um, <laughs> Um, but since we believe that God is not fair, right, and that God is merciful, uh, what I said is, well, look, if it's a deal, if it's an exchange, it can be unfair or fair. But if I'm going to give it to you anyway, you can't take advantage of me. And this kid looked at me like his mouth open and said, that means St. Gregory's is invincible. <laughs> So have one more question, then we'll take a break. Yes? Where do you go next to this? Or maybe the question should be, where do you grow, where do you grow next? You know, I, I'm, I'm sort of terrible at coming up with programs, right? Because um, I'm not really very good at running programs. Um, and, I, and I actually think that you know, just as I think the most beautiful worship I've ever experienced had the tech of beeswax, fire, oil, and unaccompanied human voices, period. That was the tech, right? And I think that the program for what we do next is talk to one another, listen to one another, pray with each other. Right, and then go out and do it. Um, so I don't, uh, just as I don't think that it's appropriate for me or anybody else to say this is what your worship service should look like, I don't think it's appropriate to say this is the kind of service work you should be doing because you all live in different places. You live among different people. And you know, one of the main surprising things is that the programs that church people come up with for other people are really not the same thing as work that people decide to do together because they need it, right? Um, and so I really urge people to talk to one another and to find out what is the thing that we're yearning to do? What are the things that we badly need from each other? What are the things that we have to give each other? And follow that. Thank you all so much. I believe that there's um, cake for everyone. And I look forward to seeing you at, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Thank you.